remain. <laughs> Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Joshua, chapter 6. And uh, my wife uh, asked me this morning as I was just going over my notes, she says, what did you say that you were preaching on? I said, oh, it's Joshua, chapter 6. And she said, that's what our Sunday school lesson is on today. Did you know that? I said, no, I didn't even look at it. I, had, I have no idea what y'all are doing on, on Sunday there in Sunday school. And uh, I thought, of all, do you, do you realize the chances of that? Of all the scriptures of the Bible, of all the texts that we can come from and deal with, that would be the same thing that you're doing in Sunday school? Isn't that what you did this morning in Sunday school with Joshua chapter 6? How do you figure that? How do you, how do you figure that? The Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit will put a service together to try to speak to the church? And I, I, after, after my wife told me that, I said, you know, you know, God must have something to say because I struggled with this passage. I, I struggled with this yesterday. I, 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 as I was putting this together, I, I felt like I don't feel nothing. <laughs> I mean, I was like, I'm in there and, and I, I'm here. My, my family gets here late in the afternoon. In the evening around 4 o'clock, they're going to clean the church. And, and they come into my office. Hey, Daddy. And, and my wife comes in. How you doing? I look up. I said, I'm not doing so good. I said, why? I told her. I said, I don't think this is going to go very well. But you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> but God will put it. The Lord will do it. Amen. God will place this together by the grace of God. Now, I want us to read. I want us to read in the book of, of Joshua, in chapter 6, here this morning. Beginning with verse 1. Uh, Joshua chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Now, Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its kings and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. Then this you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up every man straight before him. Amen. I titled this series, this won't be the only message uh, dealing in this. I want to deal with the entire chapter 6 of Joshua uh, for the next uh, few weeks. But titling this message this morning, Victory Through Faith, How to Be Victorious Throughout Life. How to Be the Victorious Christian. Throughout life. Now, I, I, everyone might be saved in this place here this morning. I pray that every person is saved, blood-bought. But it could be possible that even though you're saved, and even though your sins are forgiven, maybe you have not personally obtained victory in your life. And your walk with God. I've known Christians that have not obtained victory. Now, there's, I'm not, there's no condemnation. There's no putting down anything. But maybe there are struggles in your life. Maybe there are difficulties. Well, I believe that if you will sincerely, from your heart, follow the plan that I'm going to lay out here, which I believe are in the Scriptures. I'm going to deal with one point here today. But I believe if you'll, if you'll follow the plan here, there's about seven or eight points and apply these faithfully to your life and do them, I believe that you'll have victory in your walk with God. Let us pray. Victory through faith. Father, thank You for the Word of God. Thank You for confirming the Word of the Lord today. I believe without a doubt that You have something to say to us this morning. Lord, there's something You want us to grasp. There's something You want us to receive. Something You want us to do. And I'm asking for Your help. I pray... For the unction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, giving you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. You know, if you haven't noticed or if you haven't realized, sometimes God may ask us to do something that seems absolutely impossible. He'll do that. He'll, he'll ask you to teach something. He'll ask you to preach something. He'll ask you to do something 
that in your own strength, in your own human ability, it seems absolutely impossible. It may not make any sense as far as the natural mind is concerned, but we know that with God, all things are possible. In fact, we know that all things are possible for you, but for me, for myself, we might have trouble uh, believing that. You know, I can believe for somebody else, uh, but when it comes to me, I have a little bit more trouble. Well, to give you a little background here of our text, we know that Moses had died and God had put Joshua in charge of Israel. They had crossed the Jordan River and entered into that promised land. That land that God had promised to Israel. The land that flowed with milk and honey. A spiritual inheritance. Forty years before this, Moses tried to lead Israel into that great promised land. But because of Israel's lack of faith and disobedience and unbelief, they did not enter in. Instead, they would wander in that desert wilderness for 40 years. Amen. There's a uh, possible that you can uh, be saved here this morning, but because of lack of faith, uh, because of maybe unbelief in certain things or areas of the Bible or things that God told you, uh, or because we have a murmuring and complaining spirit that we can be wandering in a desert place for 40 years or a long time. I don't have the victory. Uh, I can't feel the presence of God. I have no joy in my life. There's no peace in my heart. Why is that? There may be something that's hindering uh, the moving and the flowing of God in your own life. If it could be, uh, it's because of unbelief or even our own hardness of heart. We know that Jericho was one uh, of the major cities that Israel would have to have to defeat. God told them to cross that Jordan River and march around that city one time for six days. And on the seventh day, they would march around seven times. They would then blow the trumpet, shout, and the wall would come tumbling down. Now back at this time, we know a city had a wall built around it to protect it from the outside enemies. You understand? We need a wall built around us. We must have the wall of prayer built around us. If you, uh, I tell you, if you if you let that wall of prayer crumble, if you don't if you don't maintain it, that enemy will get in some way somehow. If you don't have that that uh, the Lord's armor uh, buckled to you, fastened to you securely and tightly, then that fiery dart, that arrow, will find a way to get in to try to bring you down. Yes, sir. We must maintain the walls of consecration. Consecration. Maintain the walls of holiness. Maintain the walls of faithfulness. Maintain the walls of consecration. Maintain the walls of the Word. Maintain the walls of prayer and praise and adoration and worship. Yes, sir, we must maintain those walls spiritually in our lives. That's not in my notes. It just came to me. I just, I see that here. But we see uh, that, that back at that time, a city had a wall built around it to keep out the enemies. Uh, this wall would be about 30 feet high, 10 to 12 feet thick. I just read yesterday that some walls, and they believe even Jericho, their walls were 20 feet thick. Now, in, notice this, church. In any battle, sharp, intelligent, well-thought-out strategy is absolutely essential in warfare. If we look at this in the natural, it is absolutely essential. Any country that goes to war must must have and always have a strategy. That's right. You count the cost. No significant victory can be won without a well-planned military strategy. Strategy in military conflicts is so important that most nations have established military academies, basically to train their officers how to lay strategic plans, how to carry out orders during military campaigns. Yes, sir, strategy is very important. I just interject something here. I'll come back to it maybe a little bit later, but I want you to notice that there's no argument with Joshua. He gave the orders and they did it. They're a type of the church, folks. Amen. You understand? He just told the, the people what to do and they did. He heard from God. He's relaying the message from God from his heart to the people and they simply did what Joshua said to do. They did not argue. Amen. Oh, you couldn't have that today. Oh, no, the pastor tries to tell somebody what to do. Oh, I don't want to do that. Uh-uh, I ain't going to do that. I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. Somebody, you know what I'm talking about. You'll do. Oh, yes, sir, you'll just do. But you'll, a lot of times, you, you'll, uh, the church today will do what the pastor says, but they grumble and gripe and complain and gossip behind his back every time he asks them to do something to try to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying? Hey, they didn't argue. They didn't, uh-uh. I mean, they just did. They marched every day like they said they'd do. On the seventh day, they did what they said. Uh, amen. That God told them to do through Joshua. They 
they just carried out the orders. I said, folks, we are an army. And the army, uh, we are a church and the army and an army of God. We must carry out the orders and the great commission that Jesus Christ has given us. Isn't it true? Now, now understand, strategy, strategy is important, but the strategy to conquer the city of Jericho was unique. Number one, it was unique in two ways. Number one, the strategy, number one, was laid out by God. And secondly, the strategy was a seemingly foolish plan, at least in the eyes of man. I mean, think about it. I mean, come on. Walls 20 foot thick, 30 foot high. And you've got uh, people that come out of that desert land. And, and, and you know, and, and, and there, they just march around it. I mean, and, and there, and the walls are going to collapse. I mean, in the eyes of man, this is foolishness. Now, I mean, if you were to go to uh, the, the top uh, person of, the, uh, uh, of our military uh, armies today, and you were to lay out a plan like this, they'd look at you and lock you up. I said, you wasted my time. But you know, the Bible says, but God, I love this. But God, you you say, but God, but God, I see that's the difference. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the same to wise. And God has chosen you and I. He's chosen the weak things of the world to put the same to things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. He did this with, with Gideon. I mean, 32,000, we can do it. I mean, we can defeat the Midianites with 32,000 in our church. That's a big congregation. But when He knocks it down to 300... How are you going to reach a city with 300? How are you going to reach a city with 30? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But see, God said, I, I want to do this, Gideon, because I don't want you to glory in yourself. I don't want you to think that it was you that did this. I want you just to realize that I, the Lord God, called you. I'm the one that's going to do this. Could it be possible that God could use this little church to do something great in this city? If we have an army like 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 Joshua, sure we can. We don't have that yet, but we need to work on that. Uh, you know, now now after hearing what God told Joshua, can you imagine what someone might have thought? I mean, if Joshua came up to you and, and told you this plan, I mean, you know, someone might say, okay, Joshua, let me be sure that I've got this, this straight. I mean, you say that for six days we're going to walk around the city of Jericho carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying absolutely nothing, with seven of our priests blowing the ram's horns trumpets. And then on the seventh day we walk around seven times silently. And then all at once when the trumpets start blowing, we all start shouting, and those double walls are going to fall down. Come on, Joshua, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Come on. Man, you're not with it. That's not the that's not the trend of the church today. Now you're you're telling me that we're gonna trust God? You're telling me we're gonna we're gonna what? We're gonna walk around and, and, and this you're you're what? Well you can walk around that thing, Joshua, but I'm not gonna let them people think that I'm a fool. You can go to that church if you want to. But I'm not going to let them people think I'm a fool. I mean, I'm some Pentecostal person that speaks in other tongues. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh-uh, I'm not going over there on that side of town. I'm not going to do, I'm not going out on them streets. I'm not going to march around that neighborhood. I'm not giving out any tracks. I'm not doing it. I'm not making me out to be a fool. Come on, Joshua. You see, understand, the military strategy laid out by God really did not make a whole lot of sense. Would you agree? I'd agree in the natural. But nevertheless, Joshua believed God. You see, he believed that God would perform a miracle and give victory over that great city of Jericho. But that victory would come as Joshua would obey the word of the Lord. He had to obey God. You see, God could have said, Joshua, I want you to do this. Now, I want you to march around. Da, 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 da. Seventh day, I want you to do this, and the walls come down. Uh-huh. And then on the seventh day, he doesn't show up to church. <laughs> on the, <laughs> he's sitting at home. And he's sitting, he's sitting at home, and he's saying, I can get just as much off that television. Excuse me, I can get just as... Uh, and he's saying, I believe God, I believe God, I believe God, I believe God. But he didn't go. He didn't do it. 
He didn't, he didn't do what God said. But he says he believed God. Now, now, see, God blesses obedience. And see, it doesn't make sense. Now, come on, church. Are we living in the, in the realm of the natural? Or are we, are we living in the realm of the supernatural? Because, because Jesus comes up to a blind man. And, and the natural thing would be for Jesus to lay his hand on his forehead, anoint him with oil, and then pray the prayer of faith and heal the man from his blindness. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus does this. He walks up to the blind man and he spits on the ground. And he gets down and he picks up his spittle with the dirt, the clay, and he mixes it around and he makes mud. And then he takes the mud and he wipes it on his eyes. Now doesn't that look foolish? Now, today we'd have a mudslinging contest, so let's not get the bookstores involved in that. But anyway, that's what they would do. And then he says this, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so, so the man that's blind washes in the pool of Siloam. And you know the story. He comes back and he sees. He's healed by the power of God. But I tell you, that Jesus anointed his eyes with mud and, the, and told the boy to go. And the man did not go. He'd still be blind. You see, the two fish and five loaves didn't make any sense. But a boy is willing to give over his sack lunch. And with that, Jesus feeds over 5,000 people and has 12 baskets left over for, 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 for we can warm up for leftovers tomorrow night. You understand? But here it doesn't make sense. Uh, disciples are scratching their head. Uh, do we take 200 denarii and go buy bread enough for all these people? Jesus says, no, you feed them. How do I feed them? It's by faith. It's by, it's by doing what God's told you to do. Give them your lunch. Take the five loaves. Take the two fish. He blesses as it breaks it. There's 12 baskets left over. Nobody gets up. Everybody's too full to move. (laughs) You see, if we want the victory in our life, then we must obey God's Word. Folks, uh, you've heard me preach in and out. I mean, I was thinking this. I, I've preached here in Marion 10 years now. If I average three, three messages a week, I've got over a thousand messages here preaching in 10 years. Over a thousand is more than that. Uh, you don't include all the nursing homes and other extra teach, preach in different places, things like that. But just in itself, you've heard me preach in and how you know the text, you know the Word. I've never preached on this particular subject here before at this church. I just put this together yesterday, you know. But the fact is, you can hear the Word, but yet not do the Word or obey the Word of God. The Bible's faith without works is dead. If we say that we have faith, then we must put that faith into action. I said it's an action word. We must do something. Joshua had to obey what God said to do. If he didn't do what God's Word said to do, then the walls would have never come down and Joshua would have been defeated by the enemy. Defeated by the enemy. And that's, that's really the case of a lot of Christians today. Now, this is supposed to be encouraging. So just hold on. It's supposed to be. Uh, Victory over Jericho was to demonstrate one great truth for all to know, and that's this. Faith in God is the most powerful force in the entire world. A person conquers and is victorious over all the enemies of life only by believing and trusting God and doing the Word of the Lord. Victory is achieved through faith. The walls of Jericho came tumbling down because the Israelites believed God and trusted His Word. That's it. That's it. You know, we're always looking for something new. Let's go back to what's old in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. And let's read what it says. God spoke. Joshua carried out the orders. And the church did. That's the same thing today. God speaks to that preacher. Whatever I pray hears from God, He preaches what thus saith the Lord. The people here respond and do what God said to do. I'm not saying God can't speak to you. Of course He can. But I would pray that people would want something from heaven, from that pulpit. Now, if you haven't noticed, there are a lot of enemies that war against your soul. You know, there's the, for instance, the flesh, the carnal nature, the fallen sinful nature. And Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says that the flesh wars against the spirit. Who's the spirit? 
The Spirit of God that lives within you, the inner man, the Spirit. So there's a war on the inside. It says the flesh wars against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. There's a conflict all the time. See, the flesh says, I want to watch that. And the Spirit says, no, it has a bad word in it. But I want to watch it anyway. So, you know, so, so we, we try to wiggle our way around it. I know this to be very true. The flesh says, I want to watch that. I want to read that. I want to do that. I want to go there. And the Spirit says, no. And so you have this conflict. You have this inner turmoil, the war. Another enemy of our soul is the world. First John, can I take you there real quickly here this morning? The book of First John, back of the Bible, uh, just before uh, the book of Revelation. First John in chapter 2 and verse 15. Chapter 2 of First John and verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That's those that do the will of God. Not just say, but they do. They don't just hear, but they do the will of the Lord. It will be those people that live with God forever and eternity in heaven. The world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. You know that, that they can't make an advertisement without a half-naked woman. I mean, they can't. I mean, I mean it's as if I'm tired of it because i got children and I'm trying to guard and protect, you know. And, and I tell you, folks, it's, it's a nasty world out there. There, there. There's so many men that are hooked on pornography and things like this terrible stuff. Well, the world shoves it down their face. Unbelievable. That's Satan. That's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. And that's of Satan. That's not of God. That'll war against your soul. How about evil and wicked spirits? Ephesians 6 and 12. Demonic forces of evil. Doctrines of demons. There are enemies within this world. There are spiritual forces and principalities and powers and high places and spiritual world that opposes the saints of God. That attempt to defeat and destroy us. Satan hates God and he hates the child of God and he hates the church. And he does all that he can to hinder us and to cause us problems and and the vision, we fight not with flesh and blood. Our warfare is not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. But folks, I want you to understand, there are, there's that enemy that wars against our soul. But there's hope, and that hope's in God. And that hope comes by faith in God. The Lord will give the power to conquer all the enemies of this life. I said the Lord will. If we'll believe Him and trust Him, faith in God is the victory that overcomes the world. I've got Scripture to back it up. First John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. I said our faith. Don't make it any harder than it is. That's the victory that overcomes the world. It's you and my. It's our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith. Faith. See, I saw faith this week. Now, I'm not talking about a person named that. I saw faith. What are you talking about? Every day, Monday through Friday out there, even in the rain on Thursday, when the, when the military soldiers came out, three military, for 20, in the rain, these soldiers didn't bother them. These soldiers went out there to see these kids. But it, I saw faith go forth, you see. When, when, when there was that paralytic, he, he's stricken to his bed, and he has four friends, they're unnamed, and, and they, they bring him to Jesus. They, there's so many people pressing in that, that they, they can't get in through the crowd. So they decide they're going to uh, try another way. And they come in through the roof. And they're tearing the roof off to get to Jesus. And the Bible said that Jesus saw their faith. I, I, you can see faith. You see, I, you can see it in action. You understand it? Faith is the victory that conquers the enemy of our soul. 
Look at David and Goliath. I mean, all the armies of Israel are standing and they're shaking because they're afraid of this nine to ten foot giant of a Philistine. That David comes to, to get word to his dad, check on his brothers, give him a little bit of a snack lunch, and he comes up and he says, who's going to defy the armies of God? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's mocking us, that's saying these things? All of a sudden, something rised up in a 17-year-old lad. It was, hey, hallelujah. Uh, that's right, I'm going out. I'm going to conquer this time. I'm going to conquer the enemy of my soul who's mocking God, who's mocking God in me, who's trying to bring me down and degrade me. Well, the brothers were no encouragement. Sometimes you don't want to go to the church first and ask. <laughs> you just do, just go. And, 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 and Saul was no help. He's got to have the honor. He said, I haven't tested this thing out. It's no good. There's only one thing I know. God and my slingshot. <laughs> but see, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna come to Marion, Ohio, you don't know anybody, and you're gonna start a church. You see, that doesn't make sense. You see, you're gonna do what God tells you to do. You're gonna you're gonna do, you're gonna believe, you're gonna trust and, and God and so and so faith rises up in this little lad, young man called David, who doesn't have any battle experience. So they think, except with a lion and a bear. But he knows that God destroyed him. And, and so he goes out with a slingshot and a stone. And he comes in the name of God Almighty. And he throws, slings that stone, hits Goliath between the eyes, he falls dead, he cuts Goliath's head off with his own sword. Faith, he saw faith. The same with Gideon as I talked about. Started with 32,000, now he's down to 300. But it's faithful. It's faith in God. It's faith in the Lord. If you can turn with me to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. Chapter 11. Hallelujah. If we can just read. It says, it says in verse 30, And by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. How do I know? Listen, those walls didn't come down by man's might. It didn't come down by man. I wish somebody would hear me. I said it didn't come down by by man's power, but it came down by faith, 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 faith in God. I said faith in the Lord, faith that has something, faith that does something. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, also David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, work, righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised again to life. Others uh, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, and they might uh, attain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mock and scourge and chains of imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sworn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin, goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world is not worthy. They wandered, uh, worthy. Hallelujah. They wandered in deserts and mountains, dens, caves, earth. And all these obtained a good testimony through faith. I said through faith. Did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. I said they got the better. I said they received the better when they made it into the portals of glory. By faith, by faith, by faith. Yes, sir. They were tormented. Yes, sir. They were tortured. Yes, sir. They were persecuted. Yes, sir. I said that they made it. I said they endured to the end. I said they made it to that promised land. Faith. Stand. Don't come to me like that. I don't handle that real well. Because I want to say, no, you don't understand. I know what it is to be sick. I know what it is to be so weak I can hardly say anything. I know what it is to be in pain. But faith... Faith presses on, you see. Faith is the victory that conquers the enemy of our soul. See, faith is, in God is the lesson of this great passage of Scripture. It's laying down a foundation here today.
See, we see faith demonstrated throughout the, 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 the chapter of Joshua, chapter 6. We see a faith that believes God's Word and His instructions, verses 1 through 5. We see a faith that obeys God, verses 8 through 11. A faith that's patient and endures to the end, verses 12 through 16. A faith that understands the judgment of God and the utter necessity for purity and separation from the world, verses 17 through 19. A faith that experiences victory through uh, the power of God, verses 20 through 21. A faith that saves believers from the judgment of God, like Rahab, verses 22 through 23. A faith that discerns good and evil, verses 24 and 27. It's all in chapter 6 of Joshua. The underlying theme of this thing is faith. The faith always does something. Action. Preach it. <laughs> now, how, how to have a victorious and overcoming life? Number one, a faith that believes God's Word. Now, Joshua 6, 1 through 5. Let's, let's go back there. Let's, let's go back to Joshua chapter 6. And it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpet. It shall come to pass when they, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout, the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So number one, how can a person conquer and be victorious through life? How is victory only in the achieved by faith a faith that believes God's word? Because God spoke to Joshua, that God speaks to us through the Bible, the word of God. It's imperative that we believe the Bible, the Walls of unforgiveness, walls of addictions. 
but we must believe the Word of God and make it our own. See, it's not enough just to hear, but you've got to make it your own. We must do what it tells us to do. God gave the city, but they had to do something. I want to take you to verse 2 of chapter 6 of Joshua. Notice the terminology that God says, the wordology. And the Lord said to Joshua, this is before, before they walked around. He said, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's kings and it's mighty and it's valor. In God's eyes, the way God is thinking, the way God sees this eternally, He says, Joshua, I've already given it to you. But they're standing around. It's not theirs yet. And God is saying to the church, I've given it to you. My son has paid the price. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. But we're sitting around like a bump on a log. But you've got to receive it. You've got to obtain it. You've got to make it your own by faith. Amen. See, I, I give it out all the time. But we're not eating it. Here it is. Here it is. And, and, and God gives it, but we're not taking it. He says, I want you to march around seven times. And we're just standing scratching our head thinking, I think we need a, I think we need a deacon's meeting on this. I'm not thinking it's deacons now. We've got great deacons. Here. I'm just saying that I think, you know, uh, we've got to have a meeting on this one. <laughs> and it's got to go through this board, and it's got to, go, it's got to be approved. And we, see what the church has become? You know, we've got we to have 45 meetings before we can do anything. <laughs> and God said, go. Now. Today is the day. Now is the time. This is it. We, we may say that we have faith, but unless we do what the Bible says, then we really don't have faith. James said, be doers of the word, not hearers. Only deceiving yourself because faith does something. See, you and I think we have faith, but we might not really have the faith we think we have because we're not doing that's why I know just in the simple, simple task of tithing faithfully or giving, I know if we don't do that, I know you don't have faith. No, I'm sorry. That's a simple, that's very simple, that everything goes, that 10% and more goes to God first. That's being a good steward of God's money. Amen. To not give to God is to steal it and to spend it on your own things, selfish things. What am I saying? You can't give to God. You can't pay those tithes. Sell the car. Get rid of the dog. Keep the husband. <laughs> I know some of y'all thinking, get rid of the husband. Get rid of the husband. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Get rid of it. You've overspent. You can't afford it. I'm telling you if, you, if you bought too much, sell what you have, pay it off, and give to God, and God will bless you with something better in the future. <laughs> I, I, had, I had my grandmother. I talked to her the other day. 87 years old. And she's got a, I, I, she gave me that Honda. And she called, and she said, Mark, she said, uh, I want to know if you'll, you, 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 I always want to ask you something. I said, what is it? She said, well, I'm 87. I don't know how much longer I'll be driving. I don't know how much longer I'll be here. Grandma, you're going to live to be 100. There's no doubt she's going to live to be 100. I think she will. But she says, I, I got this key. It's got 21,000 miles. I want to give it to you. I said, you already gave me a car. She said, I want to give you. Why is, why? She says, I, I, you might, your teenagers might need a car. I said, well, they're going to drive the old one. <laughs> They're going to drive the one that's old, the 17, you know, <laughs> uh, the Kia that goes to me. <laughs> I'm just saying, it, my grandmother gave me a Ford Taurus, and my, my other grandma gave me a, a Honda, a Honda uh, Accord. That's still chugging pretty good. And, and then my, she calls and wants to give me a Kia. I didn't ask for this. I'm not begging for anything. I don't know why. But they're just, I'm saying, if you'll put God first, He'll help you out. Hallelujah. He'll help you out. Praise the Lord. If you can't, listen, folks, if you, put, if, you, if you overextend yourself, sell it off and do, and do what God says to do. Be faithful to the Lord. Amen. It will. Deliverance comes as we believe the Word of God by faith and do what it tells us. God always blesses obedience. Always. How, how do I know? Noah, that these people of Israel believe God's Word because they did God's Word. They carried out orders given by God through Joshua.
Joshua. Therefore, God gave them the victory. My friend, I'm nobody. I'm a nothing. But if I feel God's prompting me or leading me to tell you something and love and the love of Christ and you say, ah, I hear you, Pastor, but I ain't going to do that. Well, my friend, I, I, you may just be uh, holding back the blessing of God on your life. Especially those that are with me uh, alongside and, and leadership responsibilities. Teachers that we have here. Deacons that we have here. Amen. I do have uh, the right to share, to tell. This is what I believe God wants and this is what God wants to do here at this church. I do believe that God will put that heart and desire in that leader, that pastor, that church as He did Joshua. Amen. My friend, the victory is yours if you'll just be willing to do what God tells you to do. But many times we don't do what God tells us to do because we don't take the time to read what God says. How are we going to know what God wants if we don't take the time to read it? And how are we going to hear what God says if we don't show up to the church to hear it and it wouldn't hurt if we showed up on time? You'll never know about some of the things you missed that aren't on tape. Some of our greatest messages are wrapped up in a 15-minute devotion on Saturday night. But if you come in at 7.30, you're not going to hear. And you, you miss what the, 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 the leading of the Spirit of God for that service. I, 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 dear Lord, I, I'm so burdened Friday because I saw Young families bringing their children, and I mean unbelievable spiritual depravity, moral depravity beyond. I, I thought, how, how are we going to reach these? I felt, I felt so helpless. I, I sat there with my head down. I'm, I'm just, I, I'm, I feel so helpless. Because we, we have come into this where generation after generation we have rejected God, rejected God in drugs and alcohol and dope and, and immorality and tattoos and piercings. And this is all they know. This is all they live for. They, don't, they wouldn't even know how to act if they came into a public place. They wouldn't even know how to act if they came to church. I'm sure their kids would run wild and they would start yelling in the middle of a service. I've had that before. Arguing in the middle of a service. Oh, I'm preaching. They start arguing with each other. And how do you reach them? And all I know is that we've got to see the need. We've got to see the burden. We've got to be moved with compassion as Jesus was. But I, I would believe that would take a people that would be willing to come together and to seek the face of God and to pray for such a people. You're going to have to love them like you love your own children. That's going to have to be a supernatural thing that comes from God. The Bible says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Somebody's got to hear this today. Now, the city of Jericho seemed impossible to conquer. Now, the gates of the city had been tightly shut. Nobody went in. Nobody went out of the city. We see that in verse 1. This was the first fortified city that was encountered by the Israelites within enemy territory. Remember, they had been a desert people wandered in the wilderness 40 years. They were simply not equipped to attack a walled city. In fact, it had been the fortified cities that had discouraged the first generation of Israelites from entering the Promised Land. We see that in Numbers 13 and 28. We see that there. Remember that? They didn't want to go out. Scared them half to death. Except for who? Joshua and Caleb. There are people of a different sort. They're crazy. They're radical. They'll do anything God says to do. Isn't that something? So Jericho was a fortified city with either double walls or walls that were about 12 to 20 feet thick, 30 feet high. The city was strategically located as a fortress to guard against invading the armies coming across the Jordan River to the hill country of the Canaanites. The city was considered a mighty fortress that was impossible to conquer. Listen, it stood as a picture, a picture of power and strength of human ability. There were at least five ways to conquer a walled city in that day. Number one, by scaling the walls by using ladders or ramps. That's one way. Number two, by digging tunnels underneath the walls. Number three, by using battering arms to break open the city gates. Those big, big battering arms that come against those gates. By laying siege to the city until the people were starved. That was a way. Starve them out. Number five, by using some means of deception such as a truce or an ambush like they did that Trojan horse. 
There's five ways that from human perspective the situation for Israel appeared to be hopeless. They weren't skilled in modern warfare. They had never used ladders to scale the walls of the enemy. They never used battering rams to break open the city gates. They had never built ramps or moved ramps up to the city walls under the fire of arrows and other weapons. They just weren't skilled in this area. The conquest of the enemy just seemed absolutely impossible. And you may be looking at something now that seems absolutely impossible. But notice something, folks. There's no indication in the Scriptures whatsoever that the Israelites were gripped by doubt or by fear. None. And the, and, the, and the generation 40 years ago, that's all they were. But now you've got a new generation that's rose, that's risen up. Hallelujah. Uh, no doubt, no fear, none, none at all. No complaining. No murmuring. Nobody coming against Joshua or the leadership. Nothing. Nothing in the Scripture is indicated. I mean, folks... This is a pretty big task. They can lose their life. But you know, sometimes just to ask for little things to do, we'll, we'll complain. It's in our nature. I'm talking to everybody. I feel it. It's in our nature. I, I've learned that complaining ain't going to do anything. It's not going anywhere. Complain all you want. It doesn't change anything. If you complain, come up with a strategy of your own first. You know, uh, I, I've got one in here that if, if, they, if they complain, and it's not that they're complaining, but if they find a complaint, you know what they always do? They always come back with a, a resolution. They always, it's not just a complain. They said, I've, but I've got this plan. I've got this idea. What do you think? This might work. And I like that. It's not just complaining. They're not just murmuring, but, but, you know, like we can do. But they actually put thought into this and how to resolve the situation. Oh, I like that. See, that, that makes a difference. See, we can, we can complain. This, we just we run each other, run somebody down and complain, and, and it doesn't change anything. Nothing. Quit complaining and do something about it. Do something that God would have us to do. But there's no complaining here. But rather confidence and trust that God was reigning supreme in their hearts. They had complete assurance that God was going to give them victory over the enemy who was trying to keep them out of the promised land. They simply had faith in God's Word. Hebrews, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Let me hurry. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice verse 1. Verse 1 defines faith. The rest of the verses give us the examples of faith. Verse 1 gives us two terms to describe faith. Number one, faith is substance. Substance means confidence, being sure. Our faith is real and has substance. We have our faith anchored in a person, Jesus Christ. We don't have blind faith. We don't have unknowing faith. Our faith is in Christ. We're not just walking around in blind faith. Duh, I don't know what's going on. No, that's not who we are. We're not walking around in darkness. No, no, we know. We know. We should know. The church should know the voice of God. We should know the direction of God. Jesus must be the object of our faith. Hebrews 12 and 2, looking into Jesus, the author of our faith. The word looking means gazed upon. Our eyes are fixed upon. Author means chief leader, captain, or prince. Finisher means completer, consummator, or supreme. You see, it starts with God, and it ends with God. Your faith, it must, Jesus must mean everything to you. He's the beginning and the end, the author and the, the Alpha and the Omega. He's everything you need. He's salvation, He's healing, He's deliverance, He's the comforter and friend, He's victory. He is the I Am that I Am. You look in Exodus chapter 3, and God's calling Moses and telling Moses, you're going to go over and deliver my people. And Moses said, how am I going to do this? And Moses says, by the way, who should I tell him? Sent, who should I tell him that sent me? And God says, tell him, I am that I am. Hallelujah. I am the all-sufficient one. That's all they need to know. I'm the one that created the heavens and the earth. I'm the one. I spoke it. There it was. I am that I am that I am. God is. He's everything that we need. It's time to look to God. It's time to pray to God. It's time to cry out to God. It's time to look at God's Word. It's time. It's time. It's time to focus on Christ. It's time to cry out to the Lord God Almighty. I mean, I 
That's all I know who can help me. That's all I know who can help me. Do you know anybody else that's my dear than him? Do you know anybody else that knows what I need more than him? Do you know anybody else that knows what I don't need more than him? I don't either. See, what faith is the underlining essence or that which stands under what we believe. Faith is being true of what we hope for, which is the inheritance that we have in Christ. You see, the things we hope for are not yet a reality. It, but it's the hope we have that all God's promises will be fulfilled. Romans 8 and 24. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. But by see it, it's not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, I don't see heaven yet, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Hope is expectancy. It, it's waiting. I, 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 I'm beginning to grasp it. I'm beginning to see it. But I don't have it in totality. It hasn't become a full reality to me yet. I've been saying that felt and experienced a little bit of heaven on earth and the kingdom of God within me. But one day I'll be with Him face to face. It won't be, uh, uh, it won't be, ex- when I get to heaven, there's no more expectancy. I'm there. I'm looking at Him. I said, I'm looking at Him. Hey, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But right now we're hoping, and we're hoping to get there. I believe by faith I'm on my way. Faith, secondly, also is evidence. It's conviction of being certain. It's a belief that something is inarguably true. It's known in your knower. In other words, you know that you know that you know. There's no doubt about it. Nobody can convince you otherwise. You know Jesus is Lord. You know you're saved. You know the Word is truth. You know you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know He's coming back again. All these bear witness in your spirit. Nobody can talk you out of it. Romans 8 and 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are. Oh, children of God, we know that we know that we know. We have conviction. We have certainty. We just know. We just know. How do you know? I don't just know. He put the knower in me. I didn't have a knower before. I always doubted. But now he put a knower in me when I got saved. And so I asked the knower, how do you know? He says, I just know. He just puts it in there. It says it bears, the Spirit bears witness. He wears the Spirit. He's in me now. Where was he before? He's out there, but now he's in me. And so now he puts the know in me. And he says, now you just know. How do I know? It's all by faith. Is it by fact? No. Is it by evidence? No. Is it by, it's by faith. And faith in Christ has changed my life. It's by faith I started the church. There's no fact. There's no evidence. It's by faith I'm standing here preaching the gospel that I'm preaching what God wants me to preach. But I sure didn't feel anything. I feel it now, but I sure didn't feel it yesterday. It's by faith you listen. See, the commander of the Lord's army, the Lord himself, encouraged and gave clear instruction to Joshua. We see this in Joshua chapter 6, verses 2 through 5. But remember back in Joshua 5, verses 13 through 15, that God had appeared to Joshua. See, Joshua needed encouragement, so do we. And he needed to know how to attack the city. Therefore, the Lord had appeared to him and identified himself as the commander of the Lord's army. Remember that? He said, what's that you want? The Lord said, neither. <laughs> Joshua said, you for us or you for them? God says, neither. That's not the question. What side do you want? I like that. What side do you want? You see, it was there that God told Joshua to take the sandals off his feet. If, if you can read that, if you want to take the time, you can read that. Don't take the time. If you want to take the time, go ahead. It was there. <laughs> if I tell you not to, maybe you'll do it. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> it was there that Joshua discovered that there is a commander mightier than he who stands ready to lead the nation to conquest. So Joshua humbled himself before the Lord. He knows who the true commander is. Joshua shows signs of a true leader. God calls the shots, not Joshua. I like that. So now what? Joshua can go in chapter 6 with confidence. See, I can come and start a church with confidence. Not in myself, but but I know that God told me and what He has confirmed all along the way. And so I can do this with confidence. There are times I question, am I doing the right thing? There are times the devil gets in my thoughts, tries to make me to quit, tries to make me to doubt. That's a constant battle in my life. 
Thank God for my wife. She put up with me for two years. I fought against the call of God to pastor. For two years. Constantly fighting against this. One day I had the victory, the next day I didn't. Always doubting. And, and some of y'all say, how could you doubt? I couldn't even put a five-minute devotion together. So, so maybe, maybe you're looking at, instead of 32,000 men up here, maybe you're just looking at 300. Maybe, maybe, if I'm, maybe I'm looking for the miracle, but maybe the miracle's right here. Just the fact that we're doing the will of God. It's a miracle that some of y'all stay so long with me. Like Dean and Ida. <laughs> it's a miracle they stay after nine and a half years and before that actually and, 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 and only being two people to preach to on Sunday night. It's a miracle to see some of you that stuck with us for so long that, that, that believed in the vision that God placed in a man to preach the gospel to a lost city. You see, there's the miracle. Now, Joshua was to know that victory was guaranteed by the Lord himself. No matter how invincible the enemy seemed to be, no matter how big this mountain was. See, I do it too. I get my eyes on the mountain rather than getting my eyes on, on the Lord of hosts. And, and it seems like there's no way that this is going to be possible. But to Joshua and the people, victory is assured. See, God would reveal his plan to Joshua. Number one, Joshua is to have all of the soldiers march around the city once a day for six days. This makes no sense to human knowledge. He was to have seven priests march in front of the ark. Each was to carry a trumpet made of ram's horn. On the seventh day, the army, the men of war, the Bible says, were to march seven times around the city with the trumpets blowing. After marching around the city seven times, and seven is God's number, which is the number of completion and perfection. So the seventh, the seventh, the seventh day, the seven times, that's not by coincidence. That's the Holy Spirit saying this whole thing is ordained of God. This is God. This is not man's idea. This is not man calling the shots. This thing is God and God alone and man following the will of God. After marching around the city seven times, on the seventh day all the people were to give a loud shout when they heard a long blast from the trumpets. When the walls of the city collapsed, the soldiers were to charge straight into the city and conquer the enemy. Militarily, this would seem to be a foolish strategy in the eyes of the world. Nevertheless, it was the strategy laid out by God to his people. If the Israelites believed God's word, then they were to conquer the enemy. But if they rejected God's word, refused to act upon it, then they would lose the battle and be defeated by the enemies. Folks, Jericho is a picture of something. You see, it's a picture of the seemingly unbeatable enemies that often confront us as we walk through this life. As believers, we're seeking to lay hold of that promised land, the spiritual inheritance, the great inheritance that God has promised us. But as we seek to lay hold of that inheritance, the enemy confronts us. The enemy like the world, the flesh, addictions, anger, sin, and the devil himself. We know that the devil was defeated at the cross 2,000 years ago. But the blood of Jesus Christ has set us free. The devil no longer has legal claim on us and no longer has us bound to things anymore. But he will do all that he can to cause us problems. And he'll do all that he can to hinder us from the race that God has set before us. There are principalities. There are powers. Rulers of darkness. Spiritual hosts of wickedness that war against us. The devil has his demons and the fiery darts that he shoots are real. But the way to have the victory is to believe the Word of God. The only way to bring those walls down in our life that hinders our walk with God is to believe God by faith. A faith that believes God's Word. A faith that not only reads it, but acts upon it. A faith that's backed up with action. That's how you know that you have faith. The believer who conquers through life is the person who reads and studies and devours and meditates the Scriptures. It's that person who knows the promises of God. They, they not only read it, but they do it. It's not enough to read it. The reading's good, but you've got to do it. They live by faith. The promises of God live in that heart and life. David said, Your word have I hidden in my heart. 
that I might not sin against you. It has to be in the heart. It's nice that it's right here, but this has got to be inside. You have to become this. That's not enough just to preach a message, but you have to become that message. You have to become that Word. Jeremiah ate the scroll. He swallowed the Word. Because the promises are living within him, he's able to cling to them, conquering all the enemies that attempt to destroy him. I would pray that we would know that word so well that when we go out witnessing jobs, nursing homes, retirement homes, hospitals, family reunions, family get-togethers, you don't even have to bring a Bible in. They don't even know it, but it's right here. And when you open your mouth, God gives the Scriptures... There it is. I thought about that scripture for a long time. But there the Holy Spirit puts it right there. And you quoted it perfectly. Because it's in there. You don't have to take the Bible. I used to go to my wife every Sunday afternoon. We would go and visit her grandmother. Family all got together every Sunday afternoon and ate lunch. It was just the thing we did. I always brought my Bible in. And it always offended them. They always got upset. Who's Martin Key? Is he going to preach to us today? No, I just I always read it. You know, but I don't bring it in anymore because it's in here. I bring it in with me everywhere I go. They're not so offended by the physical Word, but I'm able to speak the Spirit, the Word of God that the Holy Spirit puts upon me to give them. 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Psalm 119.130, The entrance of your Word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Isn't that so true? It gives light. As I conclude here today, about run off the tape, many people I know, maybe good people like yourselves, are struggling in their Christian walk because they don't spend time in that Word, or maybe they don't spend time in prayer. They don't meditate upon the Scriptures. And what happens is the spiritual man is being depraved. He's being starved. If you tried fasting physically for one week, you're going to be very weak after seven days. Come back here after seven days, and you're going to be very weak. You're starved. You, you haven't given any nourishment to the physical man. And if the spiritual man is starved, depraved from the spiritual sustenance that we have, then, then it too will be weak, and you'll struggle every day in your life. You're going to struggle with sin. You're going to struggle with lust. You're going to struggle with immoral thoughts. You're going to struggle all the time. You know, the spiritual man being starved. To be honest, most Christians don't really know their Bible. They simply don't study it. You know, many are spiritual illiterate. We just don't study it. We don't. We, we, we want to do other things. Folks, if we love Jesus, why don't we love His Word? Why don't we love Him? Why don't we just take and, as one person told me, saturate yourself with the Word of God. Just devour, love it. It doesn't mean you don't take responsibility other things that you do, but you just, you know, not many, not many will read the Bible. Or you read it out of obligation. Don't read it out of obligation. Ask God to give you a love for it. If we'll lay hold of God's Word by faith, then I believe that those walls in our life that cause us problems will begin to crumble. Things like walls of pride, walls of anger, walls of resentment, walls of depression, walls of lust, walls of unforgiveness, walls of addiction, and walls of rejection will begin to crumble. And when they crumble, I believe that you'll begin to shout like Israel did. But not just a shout, but it'll be a shout of victory. A shout that comes out of a deep inner faith. A shout that has substance. It's not just noise, but it's something of God. But first, those walls need to come down. You see, the shout will come. But if we're shouting and we have those walls around us, then it's just a surface shout. But if you'll allow God to break those walls, depression, lust, rejection, addictions, unfor unforgiveness, break those walls, I believe that there will be a shout rise up and shoot. It'll be a victory shout. You'll shout the walls down, folks. I said, you'll shout them down. If we'll do that, I believe that you'll have victory in your life.
Can we stand, please? I believe that you'll have victory in your life. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. I know I went a little long today. A little long, but I, I just, I don't know. I struggled with this message. I struggled. But, but I believe this is what God's speaking to us today. There are things in your life that, that maybe you're binding you. There are walls up. It's between you and God. Maybe nobody else knows, but there are walls of fear. Walls of unforgiveness. Walls of unbelief. Walls of addictions. Walls of, 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 of pride and doing your thing rather than God's will. There are walls, folks. I have to deal with them too. I have to deal with these walls too. I, I, I know I'm being a little bit late here today, but let's just forget about that time and, and let's let God break them down today that you might begin to shout a victory shout. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that You'd minister to every heart here today. I pray that You'd help us to be obedient to Your Word, to, to do, to act upon what Your Word says. I'm asking, Father, that faith would arise in this sanctuary today. That we would believe God for victory in our life. A breakthrough, the walls to come down. That, that Lord, we might shout with a victory shout today. A joy and a peace that comes in our heart. A victory knowing that we have over the enemy of our soul. Oh God, that, Lord, we need victory of the enemy that wars against our mind, that puts thoughts there that are not of God. We need that today. The victory of the Lord by faith, I'm asking in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, please sweep across this house, sweep across this place, our hearts today. We thank You, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I open this altar and I, 